The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's War Board webinar with myself and Adam Ward. I'm Marie Greve. I'm the Director of Costello Communications and I'm facilitating this afternoon's webinar. Um, we will be asking for some questions, so please do add your questions to the webinar series as we're going on. Um, and there are some polls that Adam's already set up so that if you want to just contribute who you are, what kind of projects you're working on, what sort of clash detection software or issue management software you're using, it'd be great to let us know and then we can actually pick up on that and perhaps address some of it and give you some guidance and some tips at the end of the session. Um, this is our second Warboard webinar. We're actually going to be doing a series over the next few months just to give you some extra guidance and hints and tips on how to use Warboard. And today's webinar will be set by Adam Ward, who is the Technology Director of Space Group. Adam was actually instrumental in the design and creation of the Warboard platform. And he's pretty much the go-to guy for anything we need to know about how the project and the software actually works. So this afternoon, Adam's going to give you some issue management guidance and show you how to actually make the most of it using your project. So, Adam, I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, so what, what I'm going to cover in this webinar, we've already had one webinar about what is Warboard. And in this webinar, we're not really going to touch upon Warboard too much until we get towards the end, and then we'll be loading some stuff into it. But the idea of this webinar is more of a, how you use tools like Rev sorry, like Navisworks and Celebri, et cetera, to manage the issues. Because Warboard doesn't do that for you. It relies on other tools where you find the issues and you, and you kind of bring them together before you upload them to Warboard. So the idea of this webinar is to go through um, one of those packages, which is Navisworks. And I will be doing a follow up one on Celebri etc but this one is Navisworks so I'm going to show you some tips and tricks on uh, Navisworks um, so what, what I'm going to cover is a quick introduction uh, which will be less than only be a couple of minutes just kind of giving you a bit of background then I'll be, then we'll be in the software and we'll stay in the software for the next 20 to 30 minutes at most uh, hopefully I'm going to show you how to set up the project efficiently um, some tips and tricks how you can get those 10,000 clashes down to less than 100 or even less than 10 if you want to very quickly um, and automated ways of doing that. I'm also going to show you how you can actually make your clash reviews useful. So instead of just showing two faint objects in the distance, which you can't really tell on the viewport what's happening, how you actually really bring that to life in your reports, etc., and how you automate that as well. Um, exporting issues in a useful format. Um, so I'll be showing you some tips and tricks about actually the different ways you can get these reports outside of Navisworks and into platforms like Warboard. But I'll also be showing you even the out-the-box export from Navisworks as well. So even if you're not using Warboard, um, I'll show you some, uh, some tips and tricks on using it out-the-box. So this presentation, it's not about really about Warboard, it's more about the software before you get to Warboard, if you want to set a word, um, and turning the quality of your outputs to 11. So as a lot of people will know who's kind of done clash detection before, pixelated tiny little images that don't really tell you much. I'm going to show you how you get full screen, high definition, um, realistic um, issues that really show what the issues are. Um, so the introduction is um, Warboard is a tool that's been developed in-house at Space Group for our BIM Technologies teams, and it's been used on lots of projects, over 32 of them in the last just over a year. Um, so it's tried, tried and tested. And some of these projects are massive. So I'm talking like shopping centres like the new Victoria Gate in Leeds, Chelsea Barracks, where there's about 12 different buildings, all massive with about 50 models in each. Um, and even all the way through to stuff, something like the Brent Cross Shopping Centre, which our teams are now starting to use Warboard on, where it's literally a billion pound project with infrastructure works, 11 buildings. Each building's got 10 different models. And we've got one person from BIM Technologies currently coordinating that using our system. And I'm going to, the workflow I'm going to show you today is exactly the same um, tool and workflow that our BIM Technologies teams use. Um, 
kind of had a bit of a discussion with them, our BIM Technologies teams about this because um, they seem to think some of the things you do is kind of trade secrets and kind of give them the edge. But my view is um, we need to share this information. So I'm going to show you exactly the same workflow our BIM Technologies teams use on huge projects uh, to manage issues. And I'm talking about taking tens of thousands of clashes down to 100 useful issues and then producing a report all in less than two hours, so if not less. So that's the kind of uh, workflow I'm going to demonstrate today. Um, so, yeah, Warboard is a very quick overview of Warboard before we jump into the software. Warboard is a tool where once you've found your issues in Navisworks, Salibri, or another platform, you can upload them or sync them to Warboard. and allows you to visualize them dashboard the issues, uh, dive into the issues in more detail and assign them to people, put comments on them, put a resolve date, et cetera, um, all in a web-based environment. So it gets the, those issues outside of an expensive bit of software like Navisworks and allows everyone involved on that project to become part of that process. So warboard.co.uk is the website. If you want more information on how to use Warboard, sign up for a free trial and log on to the YouTube channel and go and watch some of the getting started videos. But in this webinar, it is kind of before you get there. So it's to use Warboard or any other coordination platform successfully, first you need to get the models, find the issues, manage those issues, um, and actually report upon them before you actually load them in there. So I'm going to show you some, some tips and tricks for that now. Um, so let's jump into the software. So I'm in Navisworks here. I'm in Navisworks 2018, but um, any version since 2015 is pretty much the same, to be honest. Um, there's not much difference. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, and this is a little tip, I'm just going to go and disable um, auto save. Now, the reason being is it tends to auto save every five minutes. And if you have a huge model with lots of models in, you can be sitting for a good three minutes every time it auto saves. Um, so I'll just turn that off generally and just remember to click the save button. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to load some models into here. Um, the first thing to understand is, and I'm not going to go into great detail about everything in Navisworks, just on the coordination aspect, but the first model you bring into Navisworks kind of sets its environment. So it sets its scale, it sets its um, various default environmental configurations. So if you think of is your project in feet, is it in millimeters, is it in meters? That first model you load in is quite important because that's kind of what sets the sets your environment up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to um, so in this folder here, I've got two two folders. One is models week one and models week two. Think of this as this is the models we've received this week and we need to produce a report for. These are the models we're going to receive next week in the future. And I'll jump on to that in a second. So in here, we have the normal architecture facade fit out MEP structure. What I'm going to do is just load in the architecture and I'll just select two and click open. I'll load them in. I'm going to then go and click on, uh, I'm just going to click on viewport. I'm just going to turn realistic mode off because that will destroy your machine. Um, I'm going to go and click append and just bring in all these other models now. So the facade, let's bring that in. I'm going to go and bring in the fit out which you won't see because it's internal. Then I'm going to go and bring in the MEP, which is massive. So I'll take a second. So this is a hospital, so there's quite a bit of MEP in this. Um, it's a good project to, to demo on. I didn't want to use unrealistic um, small models. I want to use real models. So there's the MEP. Now I'm going to load in is the structure. So all these models have been exported from the various different platforms as NWCs. Obviously, you can link in native Revit into Navisworks as well. Wouldn't recommend it. I was always I would always recommend going through the exporter, but it'll accept all sorts of formats in there. So now what we've got is we've got all the models linked in, all in the right place. Um, let's go and have a look around here. Yep, that looks fine. Um, one thing you might notice is on my screen is the graphics look a bit different to the normal out-the-box Navisworks. You look a bit more crisp, a bit more defined. Little tip, if you go into options, if you want to get this same look, 
and go into display autodesk tick this if you untick this that's default out the box which is really good and fast but if you want it to look a little bit better just tick that and as long as you've got a decent machine it won't affect performance too much so that's that so what we've got in here is various um models uh one little tip is go and delete all these default 3D views that come in. Every view that's inside each one of these can um, decrease performance. So every time you save a viewport, it kind of cycles through all of them. So I recommend just getting rid of them. Now, the first thing we always do after we've imported our models is create what's called a home view. So I'm very quickly going to click here, save viewport, and I'm going to call this home. I'm going to get the view I want for my home view, and I'm going to just go into edit. Make sure these two buttons are ticked. Now, what these do um, is basically override any graphical changes I've made on here or anything I've hidden, it'll keep. I'll explain this in more detail later. But when you're creating your default views, tick both these and then just go and click update. Now, what that means is you've got a home view, you can just snap back to it at any time there. Um, now, what I want is a coordination view because in this model now, if I now go and have a look inside here and I go and turn on my section and just get my sections up here and let's go on to like the surface. I just snap to that and we go and have a look in here. What you'll notice in here, it's very hard to see what belongs to who. So we've got structure, we've got architecture, we've got MEP in here, but it's still very hard to understand is this part of the fit out model? Is that part of the architecture model? So what, what we always do is, and you only have to do what I'm doing now once in a project, we create what's called a coordination view. So all the models, um, so for example, architecture, I always override the color to be dark gray. And I, I'll explain what I'm doing here in a second. I don't use uh, color overrides and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, this is the, um, that's the architecture and all that. So let's just override that. That's great. So HKS, uh, which is the fit out, we'll make that green. Uh, and we'll make that green and all override color. We'll make that green. And WSP, I always make yellow. The colors are irrelevant, but I kind of like pastel colors. And the, this one, which I believe is the MEP, will make, I always make magenta. So what we've now got is a very visual, we can see who, what belongs to who. Gray belongs to architecture. Um, pink belongs to MEP. Yellow belongs to, ah, got this the wrong way around, haven't I? Anyway, so yeah, so in this one, yellow belongs to MEP, pink belongs to structure. So you can very quickly see if there's anything wrong visually. So what I'm going to now do now is just turn my section off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to save a viewport. So I'm going to save viewport. I'm going to call this home, home coordination. And again, like last time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click edit, tick those two boxes and click save. Oh, that's good. Okay, let's try again. Anyway, edit, tick those two boxes. There we go. So you can see I've lost all my colors. Um, so what I'm going to do now is very quickly just go and redo that. So architecture is great. Um, HKS is green. And WSP is pink because that's the MEP. I'll do it my normal way. And then Waterman's is yellow. So now when I click update on here, it basically updates that. So now I can flip between um, traditional and me coordination view. Now what's quite cool about this, if I now go and create another view, so if I now go and do a section view, uh, let's go and enable me sections. So if I do a section view and I save that viewport there, and in here, I just click edit and I'm going to just tick this top one. So this basically says, don't override, the, don't save the appearance, but save basically overrides, etc. And we're going to click update. Now, what this means is I've now got a view. And we'll just 
which is my section view, and I'll rename this section. And I can now jump between coordinated view. So you can see if I go to home coordinate, now if I go to my home coordination view first and I go to section, it remembers the colors of the last, last um, primary category, primary one I was on. So if I go to this one, and now I go to this one, it looks in realistic mode. So very quickly, you can jump between, just by going to one of these primary home views first, you can change, do you want it in realistic? Or do you want it in um, coordinated view? So that's the first thing we do is create two views, home views, one which is normal, one which is coordinated view. And then what we need to do is, and I'm sure I'm telling, telling a lot of you how to suck eggs here, but I'm gonna kind of cover everything, um, is we create some search sets. So let's go back to home coordinated view. Now in this model, um, what I would also do before I do this actually, I will go and create a view for each different um, level. So what we'll do is we'll just go and do that now. I'll open up one I did earlier and let's go to uh, this one. Now remember you only have to do this once. So once you've kind of done this, um, all you're doing is kind of relinking the models every time. So I'll show you our typical um, project. I'll just take two seconds to load it. So that, that, that's, that's my first tip is understand what that hide overrides button does because it's super powerful once you get to grips with it. Um, you can have different view styles for under a better word. You can kind of jump around them uh, and you can have lots of different views. So let's load in. Okay, so this is the same model, um, same stuff in here. Now you can see what I've done here is exactly the same. I've got a home view and I've got a home coordination view. And if I click home coordination view, it'll do exactly the same as it did did previously. Um, now the reason I do color overrides on these is on my home coordination view rather than uh, your color your color. Um, what's oh, called now your color what does it permanently is it's really powerful so what this means is if i wanted to go and see what's what the architects changed since the last time you uploaded this model everything which goes back to its real world color you can tell they've changed so, it's, so you can see on here i know for a fact this map engineer hasn't moved this pink because that's still magenta off last time i changed it but this element here which is new it's white, so I know that's a new element since the last time the models were linked in. So all I do is every time we get new models in, I will literally just go and um, takes two seconds, just go and do this again. Uh, that is override element color gray. And then I will do the same color for pink. That's the MEP, so it'll take a second. Then I do the same for um, each case, and then I will do the same for structure. And then what I'll do is I'll just go and update this view. So when when you first get the new models and you link them in, you can very quickly see what's changed. It's quite quite powerful. Um, but now we need to get to actually doing some clash detection. So let's just wait till my computer catches up. There we go. So once you've set your models up, um, and what I recommend is having kind of spending some time at the beginning of the project to set up a slice for every level, because what it means is after you've run your clash detection, you can very quickly kind of go and walk around the building and spot issues as well. Um, so you can kind of click coordination view, you can go then jump to a floor level and visually see issues rather than uh, just rely on the software so you can actually do it. And again, once you've set this up once, that's it. So now let's go and um, create some sets. So when you're doing clutch detection, um, let's just go and uh, delete these out. The way I tend to clash models is um, I've seen models with lots of clash sets, so literally lots of clash sets in here 
in reality, you don't need many if you get creative about how you're doing them. So I, I follow a very simple method. I clash MEP against structural steel. I then clash, sorry, I clash MEP against structure. I then clash MEP and structure against architecture. I then clash MEP, structure and architecture against whatever else. So what it means is instead of having architecture versus structure, architecture versus MEP, architecture versus facade, then structure versus architecture, structure versus facade, structure versus MEP, then et cetera, et cetera. What you do is you, you, you group and you tier in it. So you go on MEP versus structure. Then you go on uh, MEP and structure versus architecture, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see on here, clash set one is structure versus uh, MEP. CT1, CT2 is MEP versus structure, uh, walls only. CT, sorry, CT2 is architecture versus MEP and structure. Um, so I'm tearing it, tearing it up rather than having hundreds of clash sets. So let's go and delete all these out um, on here. Let's go and create a new one. So I'm going to go add test. And what I'm going to, what I'm going to do here is call this clash test one. I'm going to call this. MEP versus structure. Um, now, the, the problem is if I now went and clashed all MEP against all structure, which I can very simply do just by doing something like uh, that, you're going to get a lot of false negatives and stuff which aren't real elements. Um, Architecture is a perfect example. Every column sits in a wall. Every structural column sits in a wall. Every light fitting sits in a ceiling pretty much. Um, so you get a lot of false negatives. So you've got to create what's called clash sets. So basically, it's a rule that says clash any MEP against anything which is a structural beam, for example, um, or ignore any pipe work which clashes with a wall where the wall is made out of timber. You can you can get really creative. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one to clash all MEP against all steel framework only. So not concrete columns, just steel work columns. So the first thing we do is we need to create what's called a search set. And you can see I've already got loads predefined here, but I'm going to create a new one. So I'm just going to go and zoom out and I'm just going to go back to my home view. Uh, okay, I almost have a section on there. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a search set. So I'm going to go, um, all right, so I want to look for elements in the, um, what do I want to look in? I want to look in the, in the structural model. And I want stuff which is uh, structural steel. So the best way of doing this, because this, where you what you're basically doing in here is digging in the data of the file format. So the best way to do it is to select a bit of steel, go to properties, and generally, item type structural framing. So it's come from Revit. Chances are it's item type. Now, if it's an IFC file, you could do it by the IFC object type, but generally item type structural frame. And I, I tend to keep it quite high level. So I'm gonna go item type, and I'm gonna put equals, and what I'm gonna do in here is put structural frame. Here's a quick tip, which will save you a long time. If you start typing in here, it doesn't kind of hint, doesn't doesn't kind of do any intelligent. But if you select this drop down and then you start typing, so we start typing structural framing, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to also look for item type equals, and I'm going to select that structural columns. Now, if I search this, it's going to find, click find all, it's not going to find any. The reason being is something can't be a structural frame element and a structural column. So what we're going to do is right click and just put an all condition. So find anything which is structural framing or a column. Then if I click find all, you'll see it's highlighting all the structural framing elements and columns in my model. And what we would, what I would generally do for each discipline, architecture, structure, and MEP is go and create these um, search sets. Again, you only need to do this at the beginning of the project. And I'll save you a long time when you get new models every week. So what I'm, once you've clicked find and it's found all those items, we can right click in our sets. Now, this is really important. Don't click save selection. Always click save search. 
So the difference is if you click save set selection, it's going to select all these elements and just save those as kind of a group. If you click save search, it's actually remembering this data. So next time an architect, a structural engineer links a model into this project and he's added another 52 structural columns, they will automatically be picked up because it's creating the groups or the sets via the data rather than via the model. So I'm going to save set and I'm going to call this check and I'm going to call it steel. So what I would generally do is do this for, you can kind of say about here, structural steel, structural concrete, architectural priority elements, as which are your doors, your windows, your curtain wall and your ceilings, etc. Um, so now when we go to clash detective, I'm going to, so MEP versus structure, I want to clash all of MEP against all of um, structural steel. I'm going to put a clash tolerance of 10 mil um, for the moment. We can knock that down later. In fact, let's knock it down a bit. Let's put five mil. Generally, I work the five mil. Um, MEP versus steel it should be perfect. If you're doing it against architectural elements, you might want to allow a bit of tolerance. Um, it depends on the project and it depends on um, lots of variables. Every project's different. So once I've created that set, created, just click run test. The software will then go and find all the issues. Now, the problem here is I've found 300 issues. And if I now cycle through these issues, it's really hard to see kind of what the issue is. Even if I use hide view, it doesn't really tell us what this element is or kind of, kind of doesn't give us much info. So if you were looking at a report with that, it wouldn't make much sense. So what we do at BIM Technologies is you'll notice in here, we have default clash views. Um, so for example, this is just the same process as I did at the beginning, but it's turning models off. So CT1, for example, all that's in this model, if we zoom out, in this view, sorry, is the structure and the MEP. So because in this clash set one, we're not clashing against architecture, we don't need to look at that. Um, we do that later on. So CT1, it is MEP versus structure. So what it means is before you go to your clash detective, if you just click that button, then go into your clash detective, which I'll do in a second. And then we kind of turn that off. It, now, it's still a bit difficult to see what's going on there, but it's given us a bit, bit better. So the next tip is if you click... Um, what I always do, because you don't want to issue a report with 300 issues or 10,000 issues, I'm going to group all these into one group. Um, now, what this temporarily, now what this allows me to do is click hide over and see all those issues in context. Now, what I want to show in my report is that this area here needs coordinating. I don't want to do a, I don't want to do an issue for this, for this, for this, for this, for this. Because what's actually could be up to 50 issues is actually technically one issue. This steel works too low. So what you can do, which is quite powerful, um, if you select the elements you want to include, so I'm going to select them. What you can do now is if you click here and click inclusive, what this does is will filter out out of all the issues just the clashes which involve that element. Now, what this allows you to do is very quickly do that and create a new group. I'm going to call that um, steel zero one steel versus um, enemy duct. And then what I'll do is I'll go back in here, just reset that. And you can kind of see that's now, um, that's gone. Click back on there. So I'll do, I will go and find clumps, like there's a good one. We're going to do one more, and then I'll kind of move on to the next. Um, I'm not used to having on, working on a single monitor. So that's a bad example. That's fine. He's a perfect one. So this here is hitting every beam on the roof. Now, you could do a report with four issues on. Um, what I would tend to do here is, again, select these four. Um, select inclusive. I'll then list those, actually there's five issues there. Group, 
and I'm going to call that 002 um, pipe clashing with all uh, beams on slab edges, all levels. And again, you can go back here, we say your filter, so it kind of shows everything. Um, so what you're starting to do is you're starting to pick up these, these issues. Now, I will go back here and I will kind of go and I would literally work through this, picking out, so there I would do all that as one as well, for example. So instead of doing each one individually, I would go and pick these groups. There's another good example of where you could do it all as one. So you go and group them up into issues rather than individual clashes. Um, and if you have any rogue ones left, which aren't real issues in here, you can just put kind of review and I'll kind of take all them out. out. So for the sake of this presentation, and because we, the time's getting on a bit, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to kind of use these two issues as an example. So the next step, what we would do is um, that still doesn't really tell us what I want to know. So what I would do is I would untick hide over and I would get a view that shows that really well. So I'll probably get something like that. And then just if you, you can save that viewport um, just by clicking the little camera here. Uh, and it will save that viewport. So next time you go back to that view, it's that view. And that's what will be exported when it's exported out. So this one is another good example. It's hard to see anything in there. So if we kind of get a view, I tend to kind of get down below and kind of look up at the problem. Um, so what I would probably would want to do on this one is hide the hide the slab because um, you can't really see what's going on in there. So I would get a view like this. And again, what I would have to do if I've done that is go and update this view here. I'll just quickly go and uh, update that. Okay. So what I would do then is I would again I would save that view, um, and what that means is. I've now got some really good views in my model about kind of showing what the issues are. So you've took those 10,000 issues down to maybe 100. Um, so it's a really good way is if you create a group, clash everything, get, get all your clashes, create one group, then kind of go and look for clusters and create issues from those clusters. The good thing is this will always stay um, an active issue until every sub element in that group has been resolved. So don't think you kind of what happens if somebody misses one of these ones in here that will always be active on you until those sub elements have been resolved so again now I can, you can see those two issues i've created have now got decent viewports assigned to them as well so the, the next step is if i now went to um report i want to create a report with these 100 issues i've only got two but let's pretend i've got 100 um and i would obviously go and create lots of other Clash sets, one MEP versus structural slabs, and I'll show you all this in a second, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, what a lot of people do is kind of use the Navisworks out the box um, reporting. So what you want to do if you're using this method is group headers only, because you don't want to issue a report for every single sub instance. You just want the group header. Uh, it'll still export individual ones you have in there, but just, just the headers. Now, if I click Write Report and I go and click Create a New Folder, um, let's go and create, let's create a folder in here, Navis, Navis Report. So this is the default out-the-box Navisworks report I'm going to create here. So it's created the report, and if we now go into here and we double-click here and we open this up, that's kind of what you get. now. You can see it's worked quite well. It's pulled through the images we had, but the images um, are still quite small. Um, what you'll notice on your machine as well is if, if you're out using out the box Navisworks, you're more pixelated than this. Um, so it's kind of, that, that's not a very good report in my, my eyes. So the next little tip or trick is you can change the resolution and the quality of how Navisworks exports those. So if you go up to Navisworks, now before you click the options button, if you press hold shift, you get special um, menus pop up. So if I click options without pressing shift, you'll see what you get in here is kind of these, and you're kind of limited. But if you now go and do the same and you press shift, you get a few extra ones pop up. Not only do you get a few extra ones pop up, if you go into something like... Um, 
anything here, you get extra. Now you can break things, so be careful. You get extra things pop up. So one of the things you get pop up if you press shift, click options, click on viewport defaults is the viewport report. What I tend to do is knock this up to, um, I don't know, it's put that 1800. And I'm gonna put the, and the, and the, and the and I'm gonna put that up to two um, and just click okay. Now that's a, that's a default setting. You don't have to do that every time. You do that again once in your Navisworks and Navisworks will remember it. So now when you export from Navisworks and you go and kind of do your, um, your cash report, and you kind of click write report and you go, I'll overwrite this one. What it will do is it'll take a bit longer, not too much longer, hopefully. Um, but what you'll get is you'll get much better quality images come out. Um, it's hard to see on there, but it, it, it's a lot better, higher resolution. Um, so that, that's one way. Now I'm going to show you how Warboard works with this. So we went and found the issues. Instead of exporting an X, uh, HTML, I'm going to export an XML. I'm going to write the report and I'm going to save this. In a, I'm just going to save this. Uh, I'm going to call this Warboard. So now if we go and look at that and we go to data drive, um, projects, warboard, and we go to Navisworks report. We've got here, we've got just two bit, let's delete them because that's going to confuse things. That's the old Navisworks. So what warboard will do is if you export an XML, all tests combined, or you can do individual and put them all in one zip, what you get is these two. So basically you get a big, um, XML file, which is just a kind of structured data file. And what you also get is a report with all the images in. Um, again, when you export, make sure you have ambient occlusion turned on because it really does bring out these shadows. Um, so now what you do to get this onto Warboard, it's as simple as creating a new zip file. Well, let's call this Warboard. And I'll just put these two files inside of there. And I can go and delete these now. So I've got a zip file with those two files in. Now, if I now go to Warboard, and we go to Login, what I'm going to very quickly do is create a new project. Um, new project. I'll do a report style, simple. Now we'll do modern, create report. So I've just created a project there. You must enter a project description. Okay, there you go. Um, so now if we now go to projects and we scroll down, boom, 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 boom. We'll, go, we'll open this project. Obviously there's nothing in here yet. So what I'm gonna do is go to clash tests and I'm gonna go and upload a report. I'm now gonna go and just put in 10,000. If you watch the uh, Warboard webinars, I'll show you how you get this exact figure. You can click this button here. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to put this 10,000 objects in here. I'm now going to go back to where I exported my uh, Warboard report, which is here, warboard.zip. That will now upload to Warboard. Um, it shouldn't take long. There's only two issues in that one. Uh, it can take up to five minutes if you've got thousands of issues. I'll get an email when the report's ready to be reviewed, um, which shouldn't be long. So if I just click refresh, you can see I've now got two new issues. And there won't be any charts till you've done a number of uploads week after week after week, and then you'll start to see new active resolved um, charts coming through. So now if I click on clash tests, you'll see CT1 MEP versus structure. I can now go in and view those issues in more detail. Now, the reason this one's pulled through um, is because, sorry, this one's pulled through is because when I export it from Navisworks, you can see it's put as um, approved manually, basically. I, I should have unticked reviewed when I did that. And I should have actually had that ticked, um, but never mind. Um, but you can see how it's pulled, pulled them through and you've got proper images. I can now assign it to somebody on the project, put a date it's due, which doesn't exist in Navisworks. I can put comments in. 
I can add people to this project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what I can also do is if I click overview, I can click view report, and what I'll get here is a is a report with full blown uh, images with all that information on there as well. Um, what Warboard will also do, and then I'm going to jump back off Warboard very quickly to finish up, is it will also pull through the actual um, element IDs of the Clash objects, even from groups. So it will pull through the default first one in the tree. So you can still kind of get the element ID if you want to find that in Revit. Or if you want to export the BCF from Warboard and actually locate that in the model, you can do that as well. So... I suppose that's that's the basis of my presentation. Um, I'm trying to keep it quite quick and quite um, useful. So what I'm saying is don't just go into Clash Detective, MEP versus Structure and find 10,000 issues. Get creative with your um, Clash sets. Not only that, when you do get 10,000 results back, instead of just exporting thousands of viewports with kind of um, stuff like this, um, Kind of like kind of just stuff that's like this and doesn't really tip well. It would be kind of like that a box hitting a beam and not telling you exactly much about it. Actually, try to get a view which shows shows the issue and spend the time to do that now because next time when those new models come in, you basically just re link in the models and you just um, takes takes half an hour. So to set the project up might take you half a day. Bring the models in to do all this aspect etc but once you've done that it's it's done so you can see on this project what i've done is i've got default clash views for every one of my clash sets so if, when i'm in a meeting for example ct1 mep versus structure now if i was in home view and i was wanted to show um these issues which i've exported the viewports I don't know why it does that. Anyway, there we go. So if I now wanted to show these issues here and I clicked on one of these, it's not going to show the same view that's in the report. Now, that's because, again, I've got to click on this view first. And then after I've clicked on that view, then click on that view. And that just means you get exactly the same image that's in the report. So if I now click that, click that, it's going to give you the same view. You can also click Reset Appearance if you want to, which will do the same job. Um, yeah, my computer's been, been a bit slow, to say the least, but never mind. So that's that's one of the other tri tricks we do, because not everybody can use Clash Detective and kind of navigate around issues and click on this before you click on this. So a lot of people just export the viewports. Um, so one of the options in here is you can... Um, Export HTML, export the H, uh, XML, or as viewports, which will, if I write report now, you'll notice over here, in a second, it's just created them with those views in as well. So it's, very, it's a quick way for people who want to, um, in a meeting, visually, visually see that. Um, yeah, so what have I missed? I think I've covered up pretty much the main items. Um, yeah, so that, that's, I think that's that's the key. That's the fundamental core of it. Um, I know it's very technical and very quick. Um, if there's anybody who wants a follow-up webinar, please, uh, please feel free to ask. So if there's any questions, if anybody wants to put questions in, um, if you put them in, I'll, I'll try to answer them. I'm just having a quick peek now. I don't know if you can see any, uh, Mary. Mary. Yeah, that there was just a couple of questions came through, but before we go to those, Adam, I just could you just quickly go back and say what happens if someone misses one of their clashes? You know how we had you, you they get all flagged up. Just what happens if someone misses it? What what's the process for, for going back and flagging that? Somebody, what do you mean by somebody misses a misses a clash? It was just when you said earlier on that the program automatically tells someone that there's an issue or they've got a task what if someone misses that how do you actually resolve it um i mean it, it shouldn't be because it i mean it's it's, it's in the software it's, it's it's a logic um it's a logic bit of code so it basically says find any items where this item hits this item within a certain tolerance um 
then it's an issue if that makes sense. Um, if there's something, a good example, maybe there's something here which isn't a clash. So a good example might be, um, I'll see if I can find one actually. A good example, there might be something which isn't a physical clash, but something which is wrong. So this isn't, this is on purpose, but let's pretend, for a good, a good example is a column in the middle of a room. It's not a, there's a good example. Now that column maybe should be sitting against this wall, but the software is not going to pick that up because it's not a clash. Um, so this, this is why in our BIM technologies teams, what we do is we create all these views. And after we've let the software find the clashes, what we do is very quickly kind of walk around the model looking for things which are wrong. And because you've done this color coding um, of the models, it's very quick to spot things. So you can very quickly see if, for example, a structural column and an architectural column, column don't align. If that yellow was actually um, sitting like that, then that would very, if anybody who knows what they're looking at, that would spot up, ah, there's a problem there. Um, and so the, the software is not the holy grail. It's not going to find all the issues. You still need a human to, to go and look at the issues. Um, and that's the other reason why the way we do it is we group everything into one, then we pull out clusters because nobody wants to sit in a coordination meeting and go through 20,000 issues when in reality in them, there's only 100 issues because they're all the same, just on different levels. So by being able to cluster them into clashes into issues, very quickly using that method, it kind of it, it pulls that um, method down. Yeah. So if you wanted to put this one into Warboard, for example, um, so let's say that column's aligned and it's wrong. What we do, what we have on Warboard is, if I could just quickly log back onto Warboard, you can still upload non-clashes. So um, if I now go to that project we've just created, and I'll just scroll down to here and go to this one. And we go to clash tests. So what I've got in here is custom clashes. Now I can click on here and add a clash. I can upload a clash manually to here. Or what I can do is I can click on custom clashes and upload one to kind of custom clash space. So what I'll do is I click on here, upload clash. So instead of pulling it through from the software, what I can do here is if I go back to Navisworks and just do a, um, I'll just do. Now you could do this for a drone or even a photograph of something on site. Let's just save that, save as desktop. Let's save it in music actually, so I know I'm saving it. Music, capped the whole deal. Um, so I've just saved that as an image. Now that could be a snapshot of a 2D drone. It could be a photograph from site. So I'm just gonna click, set clash image, click on music, select that, pick, pick that, uh, zero, zero, three, uh, column, spine, level ground plan. click upload it will then add that to, to warboard so now what you'll see that's been being added and now it could behaves like any other issue on warboard and again if you print your report um it comes through there as well so you can still pick up issues manually if you want to add those issues and we do quite often we do walk through the model this way and and try to spot things which the software warm pickup. And Adam, how, how could you just explain to people listening the benefits of Warboard over other software yeah, that's so, similar so the, the, Yeah, so the benefits of Warboard is, is um, I mean, Navisworks is a great tool, but all those issues are locked inside of here. Now, of course, you can export a HTML report but people can't comment on that and they can't feed back on it. So what, our, what we tend to do is use Warboard. In fact, let's go to a real project. Um, I'll go to a project I've actually been doing open. So we would go, it allows people who are non-technical via the web page to see, oh yeah, this project's going in the right direction. The latest status of it, who's got the most issues assigned to them. It allows them, without opening up an £8,000 piece of software like Navisworks, it allows them to actually go and be part of it. So you can see on here, I could be a client and I could go and comment on this. I can go and kind of put my feedback on it. Not only this, it's a much more efficient way for the design team to do it. So what we do is we get the models on a Monday. We do what I've just shown you on a Monday afternoon. Um, 
we upload the report to our board on the Tuesday. The design team then go and look at all the what's assigned to me and kind of comment on things. Oh, structural engineer's got to move this, blah, blah, blah. We would then print a report. We have a design team meeting on a Wednesday. Um, and then two weeks' time, that happens again. Um, next time the new model, the new clashes are uploaded here, if stuff have been resolved, it disappears. So it, it kind of, it's a, it's a way to release all that from outside of Navisworks and make it in a really easy to use interface. Plus, the reports are much better. So on our, you get a full page kind of status page. You get kind of a contents page, which is hyperlinked. You get sections, so you can see on here, with all the comments, um, et cetera, et cetera. Just a quick one while I'm here. What you'll notice in here is, um, bad example, let's go back. I'll just go back in time a second. So you can go back in time as well, so I'll go back to kind of, there we go, I'm just going to update that. So for now, concrete slabs. So you can kind of see, you can go back in time and, and, and view issues that way as well. So it's a full history um, of all the project. Yeah. And I mean, Adam, if, the next question that's just come in is, can you export the reports as graphical statistics from the board directly? I don't know if you can see that question. Is this showing how many clashes have been found? Um, from Warboard directly. Um, one second, let's have a bit of question just so I understand this a bit better. I'm not sure I understand. Can you, export, can you export the reports as graphical statistics from Warboard directly showing how many clashes have been found, how many have been resolved, etc., as yeah. a graph, for example? Yes, so on Warboard, um, if I now go back to overview, so this is the project overview of that page. So you can see on here, you get the current status, you get all the time. So you can see on the 20th of July, there was eight new, 35 issues active, and 214 had been resolved on that date. The next week, 222 had been resolved. There was 16 new and 15 active. So you can track over time. You can track how complex, how many elements are in the model, basically. And you can also see the issues, how many has been assigned. So I can see on this model, and this is a test model, so don't, this is not no criticism of WSP. I can see on here, um, WSP are the most outstanding issues assigned to them. Um, and you can see on here, issues over time, you get that in a tabular form. Um, and again, you can go back in time. So exactly like I said before, if I wanted to go back to the very first report that was uploaded, I can do that and you'll see everything here goes to new because everything was new on the first day it was found. Um, and when you click view report, and it generates this report, what it does do, it puts all these charts in as a as a state summary page, I suppose. So it does, does bring them out in the report as well. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions that we've had. If there's anything else, oh, hang on, maybe there's one more just come through. Just give me a second. No problem. Right, on, Anthony. I'm really struggling to, understand, to see the questions on this interface. So am I actually, just give me a second. No problem. Just give me a heads up one thing. Okay, um, I think the last thing that we need to do just to round things up is just to show exactly how easy it is for the Navisworks plugin to match up with Warboard. Say again, sorry. Sorry, um, just to wrap things up, just to actually say how easy it is for the Navisworks plugin to match up with Warboard and how actually people access it directly. Yep, so the is a Navisworks plugin. I don't think I've got it installed on that. That's in Manage 2017. So if I go to Manage, um, yeah, got it installed on it. Here's a 2018 version. I just, I, I don't use the plugin. I use XML because it's more, more flexible for my needs. But, um, I'll show you the plugin. So we have got a plugin. So instead of having to go through export into XML, then upload into Warboard, or export export the BCF then into Warboard, what you can do is um, let's just open up any model. It doesn't matter. I'll just for the sake of this. Um, 
Let's take a second. Um, there's a native Navisworks plugin, which basically allows you to automate that export to XML, zip up, upload to Warboard. Um, so if I now go to tool add-ins, click Warboard, I'll get a little um, Warboard. And if I log in as me, and I go, um, I think that's my password. Might be wrong, let's have a go. Maybe not, maybe I've put my wrong password in. So what we'll do is I'll pull through all my projects, um, which I'll show you in a second. We've actually took this plugin offline temporarily for the moment, just so everyone's aware. If you're trying to get access to it now, it's because we redid it to be a bit more, um, uh, yeah. Um, see if I remember my password. I said I never used the Warboard plugin. Um, the reason to, to probably work just to understand why I don't use the Warboard plugin. What I tend to get quite a lot on big projects is, as well as you might get individual clashes or uh, issues where you might want hidden mode on, but on the next clash, you want it to be kind of show everything or be semi-transparent. Now, the problem is with um, Navisworks default is you can have one or the other. So you can have hidden, everything hidden, everything dimmed or kind of everything on, and that applies to the whole set. Uh, what I sometimes do is I'll export each individual one, these individually. And then what I'll do is open side by side and swap out the image. And then when you upload to Warboard, you get the exact view you want for for that um, thing. So yeah, the, the plugins um, been a bit of a pain. Trying to think of my password. One second. Um, well, perhaps what we can do is we can send everybody a little bit of a, a detail on. I mean, I mean the, idea, yeah, the idea of this webinar wasn't so much to cover Warboard because that was the last one and there'll be lots more stuff on Warboard. The idea of this webinar was more about how you, I suppose it was more Navisworks showing you how you manage your issues in Navisworks um, efficiently before you get to Warboard because you to use Warboard, you need to use Navisworks or Slavery or similar tool to kind of get the issues. Um, yeah. Okay, that's great. What we'll do is we'll stop recording this right now and then we'll upload it onto YouTube so everybody can get access to it. But also, people have got access to your email, Adam, if they want to email you directly with any further questions. Or maybe we could offer one of the one-on-one -on -one, um, tutorials that you offer, like the blind demonstrations. Yeah, no problem. Okay, that's great. Thanks for listening, everyone. Goodbye. No problem. Cheers, bye.